together and sing with me. There will be no dark valley when Jesus comes. Shake the, sl the sleep out of your eyes here and sing about hymn number 38. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. To gather his loved ones home. To gather his loved ones home. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. Hymn number 38 on the second. There'll be no more sorrow when Jesus comes. There'll be no more sorrow when Jesus comes. But a glorious morrow when Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. Sing it now. To gather his loved ones home. To gather his loved ones home. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. There'll be no more weeping when Jesus comes. There'll be no more weeping when Jesus comes. But a blessed reaping when Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. To gather his loved ones home. To gather his loved ones home. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. There'll be songs of greeting when Jesus comes. There'll be songs of greeting when Jesus comes. And a joyful meeting when Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. To gather his loved ones home. To gather his loved ones home. There'll be no more valley when Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. All right, turn over to 54, Beulah Land. <coughs> Hymn number 54. I've reached the land of corn and wine, and all its riches freely mine. Here shines a nimmed one blissful day, for all my night has passed away. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on thy highest mount I stand, I looked away across the sea, where mansions are prepared for me, and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home, forevermore. My Savior comes and walks with me, and sweet communion here have we, he gently leads me by his hand, for this is heaven's borderland. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I looked away across the sea, where mansions are prepared for me, and view the shining glory shore. I have my home forevermore. A sweet perfume upon the breeze is born forever. Trees and flowers that never fading grow, where streams of life forever flow. 
Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea, where mansions are prepared for me, and view the shining glory shore, my have my home forevermore. The zephyr seem to float to me, sweet sounds of heaven's melody, as angels with the white robe throng join in the sweet redemption song. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I looked away across the sea, where mansions are prepared for me, and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. All right, brother, you got it working right over there. All right, he's going to figure out how to export all those files and get them on Sermon Audio. That's going to be fun, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, it won't be that hard. I'm sure there's something in there to convert them anyway. But if it was a Mac, you just push a button and it just... That's, I mean, it, it works for me. Every time I use it, it works just fine. If I let you guys use it, something goes wrong. Is that right, Brother Paul? That's how that works. If I put you back on Windows, that's all there is to it. <coughs> Now, I actually thank the Lord, Brother Finney, sent us that computer, and it's working good, isn't it, Brother? It's good because Brother um, brother Aaron's got a lot of work to do for us, so he's for the Lord, and, and uh, he's preparing a lot of things, and he spent the weekend just really, man, that was a lot of time, wasn't it? I, I seen one, one uh, post you put on Facebook, and you're like, 161 updates or something like that. <laughs> it's like, oh, man, this is going to take forever. But uh, anyway, so he finally got it, though. And uh, it's working good. It's worked good today. And it skipped just once for a few seconds, and then it came back or something. So, But uh, got, got it working. Yeah, yeah, it's working. So it's good when you know the equipment and you know the software. And he, he installed some software that... That helps a little bit, so there'll be more that he works on, and, and we'll be tweaking it, and I'm sure he'll tweak a lot of things and get things where they need to be, and, you know, as he learns different things about it, and got to get all ready for when Nate gets here so we can start that radio show and have that all set up right, and it'll be nice not to have any, hopefully that'll go smooth, hopefully, hopefully, Brother Paul, prayerfully. Are you talking about when he goes wake up? Yeah, I don't know if he can do that. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, that that I mean, that scared me the other day. That's the first time I've ever personally listened to that on the other end, and it sent shrills through my body, man. I was I was terrified of that. Ah, uh, no, that's done. That was Lonnie's idea, or I mean, uh, that was Brandon's idea. That's Oh, I'm telling you, I just listened to it the other day. When I downloaded that show, and I listened to it, when I'm hearing it from my end on the show, it doesn't sound like that. When you listen to it out of a pair of speakers, it's scary. It's like, where did he get this from? Uh, anyway, that was Brandon's idea, but no, it won't be making its way over to that. To that. This is going to be a completely different format. And uh, everything, <laughs> everybody's got a sigh of relief. Good, good. But uh, yeah, this will, this show will be a different format altogether. We're gonna actually have some people call in from around the world too. We're gonna interview some people, so be ready for that, brother, brother. And we're gonna figure that out how we're gonna get Skype or however we're gonna, whatever we're gonna get into that, how we're gonna deal with that. I was already thinking 
I was already thinking your place is the quietest place. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking maybe we might be able to broadcast from your place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not four kids running around and and uh, you know all kinds of other things. So so that, that, I was thinking about that when you mentioned that one day. I was like that might be a good idea. So we'll probably do that. He's got a good fast internet signal over there, and, and we might just do that. But anyway, we're going to talk. I, I've made some friends with people. Can you believe that? I actually have some friends out there. I've made some friends with people all over the world. And I, I got a call this week from a guy in West Africa. I think it was West Africa. It was where Nelson Mandela was the president. Was that West Africa? No. It was so, South Africa. South Africa, wasn't it? Yeah, South Africa. And anyway, I, I talked to him on the phone. Brother Stephen is his name. And Brother Stephen, he's, uh, he's encouraged by our preaching and everything, and he listens and, and uh, listens to our show and the shows that we did on the radio and also listens to our services here. So he just called to give some encouragement there and let us know that he was listening. Got another, I had somebody contact me from... Man, where was that? The Netherlands. Was it the Netherlands? I think it was the Netherlands, yeah. And they listened to us over there. And they were very very encouraging too as well. And just basically they like to drop a few messages. Just let me know to keep going, amen. Keep going for the Lord and that they're praying for us. There's people praying for us all over the world. That's something. All over the world. It's amazing, isn't it? But it is, they're praying for us everywhere. So I appreciate that because I need them. So do you. But but uh, And you need them because you have to put up with me. So you <laughs> you need a lot of prayer. And the Lord is, has uh, just been gracious to us and sending people uh, from all over the place. And we, we certainly wish that we could put a church everywhere where people call because we feel so bad for them. When I listen to them, you know, Hey, pray for Brother Joe in Canada. You remember Brother Joe, right? I I knew I wasn't done hearing from him. What's that? And I no, he listens to he watches every listens to all the sermons, has watched everything since the day he left here and went back to Canada. They wouldn't let him back in the country. <laughs> They wouldn't let him back in. And he said, why? He goes, well, they, they looked at him and go, well, what's to keep you from, from coming back, from not coming back and just staying there? He's like, I don't know. I got land in the house here. <laughs> and that's what I told him. I said, yeah, but if you're an illegal Hispanic, you can just walk right in. They'd be like, what's to keep you? We don't care what you do. <laughs> like that one guy on that video that pulls up to the border. I'm, a, I'm an American. Does it matter? Not really. <laughs> That's anyway, but uh, he's going to try to come back and visit sometime. But you pray for him. The Lord's laid a few things on his heart, and you just pray for wisdom. He's grown a lot in the last year, and and God's really showed him a lot of things. And he's he's been listening, he's been studying, and reading, and praying. And you pray for him. I knew I knew we weren't done seeing Brother Joe. I knew we'd see him again for more reasons than one. But I I just I I just I knew it. I just, I, somebody asked me one time about that. What do you think? I said, I think I'm going to see that guy again. But uh, praise the Lord. He's a good guy, though. He's a nice guy. But, but uh, he went out. Hey, man, how many guys go out first know you besides Anthony? How many guys have first come out? Let's go street preaching. Come right out there, man. You know? <laughs> I remember he told me, but if the cops come, you got to let me go because <laughs> cause I'm not an American. <laughs> he said, I don't have any rights here. <laughs> I was, yeah, I don't blame him. I would be too, man. Look what we go through. We, you know. So I mean, anyway, he's a good guy, though. But yeah, yeah, we don't, we don't, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. That's what they thought. I'll tell you, he's. You're gonna like that guy, though. He's a good guy. But anyway, we'll see him again. I think we're gonna see him again in a few weeks, even. I think he's gonna come for visits. So he talked to me about the Lord's laid some things on his heart and. You know, he wants some direction and some, some, uh, you know, to understand a few things. He he feels like the Lord may want him to do a little bit more for him. So, you pray for him and and uh, you know, see what the Lord does in his life. It's kind of exciting, but we'll see. Uh, the 
it was neat talking to him. He called me from, I knew when I was getting a call from Canada, it must be Joe. So, yeah. I do, we do have quite a few people that listen in Canada, though. I was kind of surprised, Canada and England. Yeah, I know, England. Yeah. Even like, like there was one in like Saudi Arabia. And guess what? There was one in Rome, and I thought it might be the Pope. I don't know. I just, I thought maybe it could be. <laughs> I thought, thought maybe the, the, the one, the, there was one, Brother Aaron, I thought maybe that one might be the, the King Fishhead himself. It might, might be him. Might be him. Himself, yeah. Don't call him that. You can call him the son of a devil, but don't call him that. That wouldn't be nice. He really is an evil man. Yeah, he is. He says he's God. In the, any man that says that he's God in the flesh is antichrist. So the Bible says. I remember when I first came to Minnesota, they said, now don't preach against Roman Catholics, Roman Catholicism. Don't do that here. And by all means. Yeah, that was the wrong thing to say. It was like, really? All right, I know what I'm talking about. And then the next thing they said to me was in, don't talk bad about Billy Graham. Don't say anything about Billy. I had one Baptist even tell me, oh, the, this Pope John Paul back when he was back when he was in charge, he said he he's a pretty good guy. I think he was a good man. I was like, really? He said that it was a Baptist that said that. And I believe the man is saved, too. I really do believe the man is saved. I was just shocked to hear him say that. But that's how far we've come away from, from truth and giving it to people and explaining it to where they would actually be comfortable saying that. Because, I mean, like if somebody walked in here and it was like, well, the Pope, he's a good man. I mean, everybody would like look at him like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what are you, what are you a Jesuit? Uh, yeah, wrong door. <laughs> Down that way. The robes and the smoke are that way, bro. Not this way. No robes and smoke this way. That way. Not this way. I'm telling you, it's pretty bad when you can smell like... It, it was like a fog. I opened the door up and I was like... I was standing there talking to Lean. I about fell over with that fake opium. That is not cannabis. If that was cannabis, everybody would be high. All right, there's so much smoke. Everybody would have a contact high if that was cannabis because that's, that stuff was like rolling through the halls. I don't even know how you can do that legally. How come you can burn a cigarette but you can burn... I don't understand. Maybe religious. Maybe they get away with it. Don't get any ideas, anybody. <laughs> well, hey, I'm not trying to stop them. Um... I want to. I maybe with salvation, maybe they get saved, but that's about it. But it's amazing. But they're out. It's all out there. So you pray for each other. Pray for all the work we got going on, and pray for me. Oh, look, it finally did it. Look at this. Every time I use this Bible again, brother Paul, look at this. It just even came more. Who's been playing with my Bible? <laughs> you know what I'm gonna get. You know what brother Russ said. He goes, don't worry, Pastor Cooley. He goes, you're gonna get. He goes, you're gonna get accused of seeing a Jesuit behind every door. <laughs> I said, that's because there is one behind every door. <laughs> right, Brother Aaron? There is one everywhere. <laughs> not every door. Not everyone. Every other one. <laughs> We're surrounded by Jesuits and Druids in this town. I mean, they're just like everywhere, right? They're everywhere. What's that? You you took you preached against the druids on Saturday. They're gonna come down and get in their Undertaker black robes and walk around you. They probably will, like the Muslims do at the Kaaba. Right? Think that's a coincidence? No, it's not. Same spirit. All right, turn to Revelation chapter seventeen. I got a lot of facts to give you, and I got to speak fast and loud and be very enthusiastic so you don't fall asleep. I will not be doing cartwheels and jumping jacks. We'll have Garrick and Samuel do those. They'll be our little, we'll just point to them and be like, look, 
we want to keep your attention, we'll have them come up here and stand on their head or something. It works. We had a whole crowd of people when somebody stood on their head and we were preaching before. And 8,000 people have watched that video, so there you go. <laughs> Can you believe that? I get more criticism over that video. No, actually, you want to know the video I get the most criticism after? The most of all. Yours. <laughs> Your video in front of that liquor store gets me in more trouble than anybody. I, you, oh, no. He goes, he said, everybody, and the first thing, well, you can't just stand in front of the liquor store. Well, yes, you can. Who <laughs> said you can't? Yes, you can actually do that. Well, you can't just block the door. I said, he didn't block the door. If he blocked the door, they would have arrested him. They couldn't arrest him. That's why they didn't arrest him. Okay, believe me. I know enough about being arrested that, no, seriously, I do. If, if, you can get, if they can arrest you for something, we would have already been in chains, okay? They would have already had us there every day. They can't. They can't. And they know they can't. That's why they don't do it. No, you weren't blocking the door. You were walking back and forth in the video. As Brother Finney used his Exhibit A in his pamphlet, <laughs> in his online documentary of, of the Apostle Paul here, and, every, and everything that he's and the every, everything that he's doing, every week Brother Finney adds something else to it. Well, Paul did this this week. He got in trouble here. And here's another video of Paul over here doing this. I don't know, but that sure is you. I mean, every time we go out, something happens like that. Like you're, and the cops, they just sat out there this week, he said. I wasn't there this week, but he said they just kind of sat out there for a while. And Dad was like, I think they're hoping we'd leave after an hour, but we were here for like two and a half, three hours. And we didn't go anywhere. Paul made sure he preached the whole Bible. It's like he'd cover every sin. And, so, and everybody was happy, so that's good. Anyway, well, praise the Lord. Hey, if you don't exercise those rights, they'll be gone. That's why you got to always keep going out there, and 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 you got to do. Hey, you know what? There isn't anybody in this city that could, can't say that 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 we haven't done more to stand up for the First Amendment than any group in this in this city. Think about it. They have Constitution Days. They're talking about the First Amendment. The, the preachers get mentioned every time they talk about that. We even had people try to get a permit to keep us out of there and actually admitted they were getting a permit to keep us out of there. So the whole town is talking about the First Amendment and freedom of speech. Half of what we do is to educate people. Now, you don't get that if you sit back on your pulpit like the Grand Poobah and don't ever leave and go preach out there on the streets. If you don't confront them and you sit in your safe little zone where nobody's going to get mad at you, where if they do, they can get churched out of there, or, 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 or you're not going to have any problems. No, you know, if you sit like that, then hey, guess what? Nobody's going to be mad at you. And you can look all professional. And yeah, you can have a doctorate, you can be the head counselor, and you can be all these other great accolades and everything else. But you haven't done nothing for anybody because you won't even go out there and tell them. You don't go confront people. Say what you want to. Watch those videos and you'll see whether, you, whether people like it or not. At least you confront them like that new age guy that tried to... Watch that video of that new age guy that I put on there. I thought everybody was going to be mad, but you know not one person got mad at that. I was so shocked. I thought everybody was going to come down hard on that and they didn't. They were like, yeah, amen. I'm like, really? I thought they were all going to be mad about it. Yeah, it's got a lot of hits, but I thought they'd be mad. Like somebody would say, oh, you're just mean to that guy. I was like, I wasn't mean to him. I mean, I was just direct with him, as direct as he was being. Because they're so used to pushing people around, Christians around. Because they think Jesus is some kind of limp-wristed, long-haired hippie. So, you know, oh, if somebody said something to Jesus, he ran away in the corner and hid. That's... Yeah, yeah, just be like him. Go in the corner and hide. Just run away. Why yeah, why aren't you crying? And, and, and I think that guy literally thought that we were just going to back off and be like, it's cool. 
Oh, you can have it. We'll we'll give this ground over to the devil, and you can have this area to do your preaching in, and and we'll just we'll just say you won. No, I'm not going to say you won. You just said that it's okay to murder babies. I'm not going to let you get away with that. I'm going to let you walk away and say that. It's ridiculous. Anyway, well, that was a long rant, brother Aaron. Revelation chapter 17. I got to hurry up, brother Paul wants to get home sometime tonight. He's got to go to work early in the morning. Revelation. <laughs> All right, y'all look a little tired. You better wake up or I'm going to start walking the rows. Nobody's even scared of that. Look at you. Revelation chapter 17, verse number 5. And upon her forehead was a name written mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Revelation 18, 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. How about that? Hateful. You ever notice that with the lost and those that have... They say that we're the ones that hate. You don't love enough people, but if you ever challenge those people, you see how much hate they have in them. There's just an absolute extreme amount of hate. They tell us that we're mean, but you can tell when somebody's filled with devils and the way they act by how hateful they get towards the truth by how much they fight the truth and they rail against it and they get angry against it. Well, Babylon is that place. Babylon, obviously we understand the Tower of Babylon. We understand going the Tower of Babel, the gateway of the gods it was called in history. Historically, that was the name that it was given. The gateway of the gods is what it was called. And, I mean, a lot of wicked things going on in Babel. Uh, go back and listen to that series if you've not heard that. Nimrod, Babylon, Isis... Uh, Osiris or Samaras and all those, if you go back there and you see what happened and what took place, wasn't pretty, bad stuff. What was it? Well, Babylon back then, it was the habitation of devils in the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So where is it now? It rests in Rome. That's where it rests today. Some try to say that, well, Jerusalem is Babylon. Not, not the Babylon that's talked about here. It's not. I'm going to tell you why. It's not. First of all, Jerusalem is not on seven hills. It's on five. Israel is not on seven. It's on five. That it's not on seven. The Vatican is on seven. Okay, that's easily proven. The Vatican is on seven. There is a, there. Now listen. Do I do I believe? Let me clear something up before I get into this. I know we're talking about Muslims, but I want to clear something up here. That the I I realize that there are. There are Jews, there are Jesuit Jews that are out there that are in high-level positions and places in this in this world, and I realize that they are apostate. They say they are Jews, and they are not. They are of the synagogue of Satan. But that's not the Jewish, that's not every person that lives over in Israel. That's not every person that lives in that land or everybody of Jewish descent. They are all lost and need a Savior. They are all lost and dying in their sins, and if they don't turn to Christ and repent of their sins and be born again by the Spirit of God, then they will die and go to a devil's hell. Amen. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through the, through the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other offer. There is no other sacrifice. There is nothing else that is pleasing to God but the sacrifice of His dear Son. No matter what nationality you're from, no matter where you're from, there's no other name given on heaven. Even under him, whereby we must be saved. That's it. Just Jesus Christ. That's all. So, uh, but, however, I do understand that Jesuits are masters of deflection. Okay? And they've masked themselves. They were able to mask themselves in Islam. The Pope was able to mask himself in Islam and sell another version, another, another type of Christianity or another type of religion to a bunch of Arabian people. And he was able to do that by masking and covering up some things. So when I say when I say that mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, is Rome, I mean that that spirit of that Babylon rested in Rome. There were there was always a place where those secrets of the arcane, those secrets of the occult, those secrets of the mystery religions were kept. There was always that Babylon was the place of it at first. There, that spirit of Babylon is still there. I do believe there's a commercial Babylon that'll rise. And I actually am starting to come under the impression that America is the, industri the military-industrial complex of Babylon and fights all her wars. That's, I'm starting to come to that, 
that place of position where I, I believe that it's the military arm. See, we think of it as location only. No, he's talking about the mother. He's talking about a spiritual whore is what he's talking about. Spiritual harlotry. He's talking about devils. He's talking about high-level devils, demons, fallen angels, a, a spirit. He's talking about that Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots. That's what he's talking about. I believe today it rests with that black pope and the Jesuits are in control of it today. We'll talk about them someday, hopefully soon. My head, it, that's, there's just a lot of studying that goes into that. And I, I've put so many hours into it, and I'm not done yet. I mean, I, I've, just, I've just like scratched the surface in starting that study. But I want to talk to you about Rome and Islam, and I want to show you, I want to show you their doctrines are the same. I want to show you the doctrinal similarities. Why are they the same? Because they're both mystery religions. That's why. And one is the mother of the other. That's why. And we know that Islam is not the mother of Rome. But but I'm gonna. I'm. I've, hopefully, I've proved so far, and I will continue to prove that Rome is the mother of Islam. She is the. She is the cage of every unclean. Unclean spirit. All right. Number one. Rome and Islam both believe in the Immaculate Conception. They both believe in the Immaculate Conception. Here's what Muhammad said in his own words. The Satan touches every son of Adam on the day when his mother gives birth to him, with the exception of Mary and her son. Hmm. Now, where would a... <laughs> Where would, a, where would a Muslim man, out in the middle of Arabia, the Arabian deserts and everything, where, where would he find, out in the middle of Mecca and everywhere else, running around, running around, where would he get the idea that Mary came from an immaculate conception? Where would he get that from? He got it from the writings of Augustine. That's where he got it from. Because he was trained in the writings of Augustine. That's where he learned it from. He was coached in the writings of Augustine. That's where he learned them. There are 34 direct references to Mary in the Quran. Muhammad said that very clearly he believed in an immaculate conception, which, by the way, didn't come to popularity until 300 to 400 years after Christ, which would be in the time of Constantine, which would be the time of the flaming sword. As I'll show you later, Muhammad was taught this doctrine by the writings of Augustine. Uh, thus, Islam believes that only Mary and Jesus were not touched by Satan. Even Muhammad did not have this distinction. Do you understand that? He is saying that even, he didn't even give himself that distinction. But he's saying that Jesus and Mary were immaculately conceived, immaculate conception. Why the exaltation of the virgin? Because it's Isis they're exalting. And it's Horus they're exalting. And he learned it from Augustine. He did not learn that from the Bible. He did not learn it from, he didn't learn it. Who told him that? Who taught him that? Who taught a man out in the middle of nowhere that? Rome and Islam both venerate a false Christ and a false Mary. They believe in a perpetual Mary, a perpetual. So it must have came from Rome. So that's evidence number one, Romanism. Romanism and Islam both believe in an immaculate conception. Number two, Rome has a pope, Islam has a caliph or caliph. Shia Muslims believe that Ali, the son of the son-in-law and cousin of Muhammad, was chosen by Muhammad as his spiritual and temporal successor as the Mali and the Imam and the Caliph. Of all Muslims at a place called Al Ghadar Qum, where Muhammad called up around 100,000 gathered returning pilgrims to give their oath of allegiance to Ali in his very presence, and thenceforth to proclaim the good news of Ali's succession to his leadership to all Muslims they should come across. So, so what do they have here? They have an apostleship. Where'd they get that from? Where there was one man that would be invested with the power and the authority. And he would be the and he would be the 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 prophet over all of them. Where did he get that from? He got it from the Pope. He got that design from Rome, because Rome has one superior leader, and Islam had that. Now that changed later in time, but but that's how they were 
for a while. That that name uh, Caliph means um, a meaning successor, substitute, or lieutenant. The rise of Islam in the Caliphs is said to translate to deputy of God. It is used in the Quran to establish. Listen to this: Adam's role as representative of God on earth. Adam is not representative of God on earth. It's right, that is Jesus. So wait, so where did he get the idea of God on earth from then in, in the form of a man? Where would he get that from? He got that from the Pope. That's where he got it from. That's where it came from. Khalifa is also used to describe the belief that man's role, his real nature is the Khalifa or viceroy to Allah. See, the vicar. See that? The word is also most commonly used for Islamic leader of Ummah, starting at Abu Bakr in his line of successors. Anyway, the first four caliphs mentions here, I'm not going to go into their names. The Sunni and the Shia differ on succession, but the first caliphs were followed. They followed. If they, if they invested that authority, if Allah said this, or if Muhammad said this is the leader, then this was going to be the successor for all. He was the head of Islam. He was the head of everything. That's how they did it. Number three, Rome teaches a world empire and world domination, and so does Islam. The Pope wants world domination. Where did Jesus Christ tell us to go and conquer the world? He didn't. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't say, take the sword and murder. He didn't say that. Where does this come from? Well, number one, the Pope believes that he should have the temporal power of the world. Do you understand that? I, I, I think you, you think it's like a customary thing when you see full-grown men walk up to some weird-looking spooky dude in a white outfit, in a white robe, with a weird spooky-looking hat on, an old dude that doesn't have a wife. It's really creepy because he's never been married. And he comes up, and they, and they, and they take this man's hand, and they... I'm not going to do it, brother, I promise. But they, but they kiss this, they kiss this man's hand, and they bow the knee to him, and they kiss his hand. Old creepy, weird, scary dude. Think about it. Do you, you think that's just ceremonial? No, that's not ceremonial. They are accepting. World leaders do it. Why do world leaders do it? Why would the president of the United States bow to the Pope and kiss his hand? Because he's. Accepting the temporal power of the Pope, that's why. Do you know what temporal power means? It means earthly power. It means that I am placing myself underneath his power. That's what that means. Kings come and bow down to him. Presidents come and bow to him. And kiss his finger and reverence that dirty, rotten devil. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I supposed to call him a nice guy who says he's God on earth? Is that what you're going to do to the Antichrist? You're going to walk him and kiss his hand and say, you're God on earth? If I was here, and if you were here at that time, I, I, I believe that you would look at him and say, you're a devil. Go ahead and take my head now. Amen. All right. First, the temporal dominion of the Pope is most ancient. Listen to this. This is from the Catholic uh, in, in their writings. The temporal dominion of the Pope is the most ancient in point of time. He commenced, as we have seen, to enjoy full sovereignty about the middle of the 8th century. The Pope was consequently a temporal ruler for upwards of 1,100 years. The papal dynasty is therefore the oldest in Europe and probably the world. The Pope was the temporal ruler of Rome. 400 years before England subjugated Ireland and 700 before the first European pressed his foot on the American continent. The popes during the Middle Ages ruled the world and placed it in utter darkness for nearly a thousand years. They suppressed any Christians, any Bible they found, any manuscripts that were true. They suppressed them, they burned burnt libraries, they destroyed people, they gutted children, they ripped up women, they destroyed, they slaughtered anyone who would not accept their, their rule over them. I want, to, I want you to listen to this quote from 1847, or this one, actually this one's from 1912 in America here. Tell us we are Catholics first and Americans are Englishmen afterwards. Of course we are. Tell us in the conflict between the church and the civil government, we take the side of the church. Of course we do. Why, if the government of the United States were at war with the church, now when he says church, he means Rome. Understand? He means the Pope. He's talking about Rome. He's talking about the papacy. 
Understand, this is not somebody that's fighting for truth. We would say tomorrow, to hell with the government of the United States. And if the church and all the governments of the world were at war, we would say to hell with all the governments of the world. Why is it that in this country, where we have only 7% of the population, the Catholic Church is so much feared? She is loved by all her children and feared by everybody. Why is it the Pope has so much tremendous power? Why the Pope is the ruler of the world? All the emperors, all the kings, all the princes, all the presidents of the world. I don't think he's talking about Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> Sorry. Listen, listen to what he says. Listen to this. Why the Pope is the ruler of the world. All the emperors, all the kings, all the princes, all the presidents of the world are as these altar boys of mine. The Pope is the ruler of the world. The Western Watchman, a paper published in St. Louis by Father D.S. Fellin, June 27, 1912. Boy, I wonder, he gave a little bit too much truth there, I think, didn't he? Maybe a little bit too much slip there. Maybe he's a little too bold. How about this one? 1960, let's see, this one is 18, no, this one's 1922. Listen to this one. The hand of God who guides the course of history was set down the chair of his vicar on earth. On this city of Rome, which from being the capital of the wonderful Roman Empire, was made by him the capital of the whole world. Because he made it the seat of sovereignty, which since it extends beyond the confines of the nations and states, embraces within itself all the peoples of the whole world. The very origin and divine nature of this sovereignty demands the inviolable rights of conscience of millions of the faithful of the world demand that this sacred sovereignty must not be, neither must it ever appear to be, subject to any human authority or law whatsoever, even though that law be one which proclaims certain guarantees for the liberty of the Roman pontiff. He says he doesn't answer to anybody because he's God on earth. That's what he's telling you. He doesn't answer any governor. By the way, that was uh, Pope Pius XI. On the peace of Christ and the kingdom of Christ. I think they got their kingdom a little backwards, don't they? I think they got the wrong kingdom they're fighting for, don't you? See, they want the see they want the temporal power of the Pope. They they believe that that is the kingdom that's gonna that's gonna rule the world. That the Pope is. We'll talk about that. That final Christ will come and and do that. Muhammad did the same thing, though. He conquered by a sword. We're gonna talk about that in a second. He conquered by a sword. He did the same thing. What did he want? World domination. You cannot disagree with Islam. What is Sharia law? Same thing. We're gonna talk about Sharia law versus canon law in a few minutes. Same thing. All right, next, number four. Rome forced conversions by the sword, and so does Islam. Forced conversion by the sword. Islam had, had jihad, and Rome has its crusades. How about it? Same thing, no different. Same crusades going on right now. Same thing. Muslims and scholars do not all agree on its definition of what jihad means within the contents of classical Islamic law. It refers to struggle against those who do not believe in the Islamic God Allah and do not acknowledge to the submission to Muslims, and so is often translated a holy war. Although this term is controversial, holy war. That's what the wars were, that's what the crusades were, were holy wars. That's when the Pope got kings to go trample the Muslims. Why? Because they were going to take the holy land, and he wanted it for himself. He didn't want it for any Jewish people. He wanted it for himself. He, he didn't care. He wanted those sites because he didn't want Muhammad to sit, or he didn't want a Muslim to sit on that temple and say he was God. That's what the war was about. He wanted to sit on that temple and say he's God. Still does today. According to the Dictionary of Islam and Islamic tradition, historian in the large majority of cases, jihad has a military meaning. Of course it does. So do the Jesuits. The Jesuits are a military order. The Knights of Malta, a military order. They are military. They, are, they push and promote the temporal power of the Pope. That's what their whole goal is. Islamic scholars that the, say that the concept of jihad will always include armed struggle against wrongdoers. It was generally supposed that the order for a general war could only be given by the caliph, an office that was claimed by the Ottoman sultans. But Muslims who did not acknowledge the spiritual authority of the caliphate, which has been vacant since 1923, such as non-Sunnis and non-Ottoman Muslim states, always look to their own rulers for the proclamation of jihad. See, there's a certain class of Muslims that the Pope really wants to wipe out, and it's that class that, doesn't, that, that, that has a leader that's not, that does not bow to him. If they don't bow to him as the supreme religious leader in the world and his temporal power, yes, 
Yeah, if they have a caliphate, they, they, then they're going to fight the Pope. They're not going to go. They're not going to because they have a ruler. They have one that they follow, and they and they, they say he is the supreme, and not the Pope. And if you say that, then the Pope has the Pope's going to wipe you out. He's fine if you have all if you accept his temporal authority. He'll let you worship a dog if you want to. He doesn't care. Muslim states always look to their own rulers of proclamation of a jihad. There has been, in fact, no universal warfare by Muslims of non-believers since the early caliphate. I don't know about that. So proclaimed jihad by claiming themselves as Mahdi, the Sudanese Muhammad Ahmed in 1882. Here's what the Quran says. I am with you. Give firmness to the believers. I will instill terror into the hearts of the unbelievers. Smite ye above their necks and smite all their fingertips off them. World dom It's just dominion theology. They learned it from the Pope. Yeah. Dominion theology, they learned it from the Pope. They, they believe that they can force the conscience of a man. Why do you think they murdered 50 million? Do you think Muslims are great? Do you really think Muslims are the greatest terror known to man right now? No, friend. It's, it's the organization that killed 50 million Baptist people in the world. It's the ones that killed 50 million baptized believers. And then some. It's the ones that it's it's the man and the and the institution that is that is that is sent kings after innocent people to destroy them. It's the one that has a whole military industrial complex today that works for him that goes off and fights wars for him. He is the dangerous one. He's the dangerous one. The Quran goes on to say this, So when the sacred months have passed away, then slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captive and besiege them, and lie in wait for them in every ambush. Then if they repent and keep up prayer and pay the poor rate, leave their way free to them. Convert or die. That's what jihad is, convert or die. It's a holy war, convert or die. And where do they learn it from? They learned it from Rome. That's what Rome did. Rome did the same exact thing and still does it in some countries. They can't do it here because there's too many of us and we have guns. Amen. That's why. God's mercy. And we have a First Amendment and the Second Amendment. You know what the, the Pope hates more than anything? The First and Second Amendment. Because he don't believe in freedom of speech. Oh, no. Oh, no. See, you're too dangerous to have this Bible, Brother Paul. It's too dangerous for you for you commoners to have this Bible. Too dangerous for the boy that, that plows the field to have that. Too dangerous for him. John Knox gave his life for that. He's out of a plowboy knowing more about the scriptures than, than a pope or a bishop. The Crusades were military campaigns sanctioned by the Latin Roman Catholic Church during the High Middle Ages and Late Middle Ages. In 1095, Pope Urban II proclaimed the First Crusade with the stated goal of restoring Christian access to holy places in and near Jerusalem. Many historians, historians and some of those involved at the time, like St. Bernard, of, uh, give equal precedence to other papal-sanctioned military campaigns undertaken for a variety of religious, economic, and political reasons such as the Albigensians Crusade and uh, a couple of the other ones, the Northern Crusades. Following the First Crusade, there was an intermittent 200-year struggle for control of the Holy Land, with six more major crusades and numerous minor ones. In 1291, the conflict ended in failure with the fall of the last Christian stronghold in the Holy Land of, at Acre after the Roman Catholic Europe mounted no further coherent response in the East. What they do? They fought the Muslims with a sword. You either convert or you die. You either convert or you die. So what they do? They do the same thing. They believe in dominion. Islam is dominion theology. It believes that the state and the church should all be mingled together. The religious state is all the same thing. They believe in a dominion theology, just like Rome. A dominion, you, can chase, you can trace them by their father. You can trace them by their mother. They all believe in a dominion worldwide control by the sword. All leading up to the end of the beast. When you'll either worship the beast or you will get your head cut off. Amen? You're going to starve. Convert or die. That's it. By the way, here's another interesting point I won't be labored long on. The capital of Rome is the Vatican. Islam is the Mecca. They both have a holy city. One has, one has uh, the Vatican that they look towards. One has Mecca. 
that they do that. Why? That's important, okay? And there's this thing called, and I don't have time to, to elaborate on this, but there's this Kaaba, there's this stone, and they all and, and they say they don't believe in idolatry or falling down and worshiping idols, but if you watch, in the, they all walk around this big black stone that fell down from Jupiter. Right, Brother Aaron? It fell down from Jupiter. Anyway... So they walk around this stove and they do this stove, this stone, this stone. They walk around it in a circle. I don't know if you've ever understood. You remember that circle maker? Remember that? That God never told us to walk around something and pray like that. I mean, he never told us to do. They never instructed us to do that. At least not. What's this stone? And why would you walk around this stone? Why would you do that? Why would you? I mean, it's a venerated object. Then where does that come from? Rome. It comes from Rome. That's where it comes from, Mystery Babylon, which is Rome. Same thing. The spirit rested there. All right, next. Rome has canon law. Islam has Sharia law. All right? Canon law is the body of laws and regulations made by ecclesiastical authority, church leadership for the government of a Christian organization or church and its members. By the way, when they say church, they mean the harlot Rome. So don't take it for what we say when we say church. Understand that, okay? That's not a biblical church. It's their their definition of Rome, okay? That's, that's what it is, so understand that. For the governor of the Christian organization or church and its members, it is the internal ecclesiastical law governing the Catholic Church, both Latin Church and Eastern Catholic Churches, and Eastern and Oriental Orthodox Churches, and the Anglican Communion of Churches. The way that such church law is legislated, interpreted, and at times adjudicated varies widely among these three bodies of churches. In all three traditions, a canon was originally a rule adopted by a church council. These canons form the foundation of canon law. So they are ruled by canon law. Now, canon law is not scripture. You understand that, right? The Bible believer, that's why they, have to, that's why they cannot accept sola scripture. They cannot accept that. They cannot accept scripture alone. Why? Because they follow canon law. They follow a law outside of the Bible. What is, what is, now, we're, not, so, that's Rome's canon law. Well, where do, Islam has Sharia law. Listen, to the Arabic-speaking people, Sharia means legislation, means the moral code and religious law of a prophetic religion. The term Sharia has been largely identified with Islam in English usage. Sharia deals with many topics addressed by By secular law, as well as personal matters such as um, marriage relations, hygiene, diet, prayer, everyday etiquette, and fasting. Adherence to Islamic law has served as one of the distinguishing characteristics of the Muslim faith historically. And through the centuries, Muslims have devoted much scholarly time and effort into its elaboration. Human interpretations of Sharia vary between Islamic sects and respect, respective schools of jurisprudence. Yeah, yet in its strictest and most historical coherent definition, Sharia is considered the infallible law of God. There are two primary sources of Sharia law, the precepts set forth in the Quranic verses and the example set by the Islamic prophet Muhammad in the Sunnah, where it has official status, Sharia is interpreted by Islamic judges with varying responsibilities for the religious leaders, imams. For questions not directly addressed in the primary sources, the application of Sharia is extended through consensus of religious scholars. Thought to embody. So what is it? Traditions of men. It's all traditions of men. But this is that Sharia law that they follow. This is what they follow. Where do they get this, this law that you must live by? Where do they get that idea from? They get it from Rome. Christians don't have a, a, law, that, a law like that. What is our law? Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter than also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. That's our law. Our law comes from rock-solid proof of the Scriptures. All right, next. Rome and Islam both call Jerusalem sacred and want to rule it. Why is it that the Pope wants to rule Jerusalem? Why is it that the Muslims want to rule? The, the, the Muslims want Israel. They, want, they put the Dome of the Rock there. Why, why is that? Why do they want Jerusalem? 
Jerusalem and Islam, listen to this, refers to the status of Jerusalem in the Muslim religious tradition. The Al-Aqwaza, whatever that name is, in Jerusalem is built on the site of the second place of worship, built by man after the Masad al-Haram. Al-Aqwaza is the third holiest site in Sunni Islam after the mosques of al-Haram in Mecca and in Medina. It is strongly associated with the biblical prophets David, Solomon, Elijah, and Jesus. It was the first direction of prayer in Islam before the Kaaba in Mecca. Before they got their lucky stone in Mecca that they say they don't worship. I, it's funny. No, you want to hear something funny? You, I was reading all these Islamic websites yesterday. I know, that's sad, isn't it? But I was, I was reading all these yesterday, and you, you know what they said? We do not worship the Kaaba stone. We do not bow down. We do not worship the Kaaba stone. All these they were saying over and over again. Yet you watch their pilgrimage and they're, and they're all walking around it. They're all venerating it. It's like, yes, you do. No matter how many times you say that, I'm going to keep telling you, you are worshiping that thing. You are counting. It's like, it's like when Christians say this, by the way. And stop. Stop saying this. That you're going to go to Jerusalem to get... I want to go to Israel and get baptized. i got to go to Israel to get baptized. You never heard that? Oh, yeah, Christians taking tours over there, and their pastors baptizing them over there. Why? Do you see what that... That's not us. We don't have that. We weren't given anything like that. We weren't told to follow anything like that. It's confusion. Yeah. According to the Quran, the Islamic prophet Muhammad was taken by a miraculous steed. His name was Baruch, not Barak. Baruch. I think. He was taken by Baruch. I'm going, I don't, I'm, I'm going to be careful because I don't want to say it wrong. To visit the farthest mosque, which many Muslims believe is the al Aqwaza Mosque in Jerusalem, where he prayed, and then he was taken to heaven in a single night in the year 620. This event is known as the Isra Wall Mirage. It's a mirage, all right, in Islamic tradition. Um, so basically he said he went, and not on a magic carpet ride, but he went on a magic horsey ride. And he, he took this horsey, and he took his horsey into... into um, Jerusalem is it is it not funny that it just so happened that the, that the, that the, one of the most holy places has to be Jerusalem had to be where that temple was had to be where the Jews were that had to be the most he had to take a pit stop there maybe the horse had to I don't know go potty or something so he had to take a spot right there and he stopped right there and he had to stop right there in Jerusalem he had to stop right there that had to be a holy place so now all the Muslims believe it's a holy place and they got to take control of it so we got to fight over it. Why? Well, because Islam wants Jerusalem, and so does Rome. Because there's a showdown coming there. And whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, whatever trib you are, there's a showdown coming there. Amen. It's coming, and it's coming there. And God ain't finished with that area yet. And there will be a remnant that believe the gospel and are saved over there. There, there will be one of those. It will happen. Okay, according to the Quran, though that's Muslim, that's where that's where Muhammad went on his horsey ride. Israel signs a oh listen to this though this is interesting. You ready? Israel signs a peace treaty with Jordan, which according to reports in the Harez newspaper included secret clauses concerning water in Jerusalem. The agreement had been negotiated in London eight months before between Rabin, King Hussein, and Lord Victor Mishkan. As a part of the agreement, Jordan would receive control of the Islamic holy sites within a Vatican-controlled old city of Jerusalem. Now, speed ahead, well, back for us, but March 1995, a cable from the Israeli embassy in Rome to the foreign ministry was in Jerusalem is leaked to a radio station, Arut Shiva, confirming the handover of Jerusalem to the Vatican. Two days later, the cable made front page of the Haaretz News. In the widely distributed minutes of a meeting with President Clinton in 1997, Perez ended the cable with the words, as I had previously promised the Holy See. See, in 1995, they signed over the, the temple rights of the mount to the Pope. It was given to him. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that, but it was. Simon Perez did that. Look it up. 
You can see it. He signed it over. They had an agreement. That's what all this Camp David and all these camps and all these... How fitting, huh, Camp David? Um, uh, that's what all these things are about. It's about that, they, they, that little piece of land over there. All right, so anyway, they both want Israel. Next, Roman Islam teach salvation by works. They teach salvation by works. You could get a man to do anything you want him to do as long as you hold salvation over him. That's why you'll never get me to be a water dog, a Campbellite. you never get me to be one of them Duck Dynasty guys. Hey, did you see that? Is that not sad? I ought to touch on that since I've seen it. Did you see the, the, the ad that I posted uh, on my Facebook page? I, I warned everybody, don't watch the video, because I didn't watch the video either. I clicked on it and said, okay, enough of that, and I clicked off of it real fast. Well, the daughter of the Duck Dynasty boys that are elders in the Church of, of, uh, the church of Christ, the Water Dogs, sent his, sent his daughter, he sent his 17-year-old daughter to Dancing with the Stars, and uh, he sent, and she's basically, she's basically dressed like a whore, and she's dancing like a whore. By the way, whore is not a bad word. It's a bad thing to be, but it's not a bad word. It's a Bible word. Teach your children what the Bible says about being a whore, and maybe they won't grow up to be one. Amen. Huh? Why don't you warn them and tell them the truth about it? Don't get scared of God's law. Preach it. Tell them the truth of it. Warn them. Anyway, so that girl, she's up there dressing, I mean dancing, and they're, they're, making, they're, they're talking about getting dirty and down and dirty. I'm not going to go into details. But anyway, that's what, they're, that's what they're doing, okay? And I didn't watch it. My wife was sitting right next to me. <laughs> so, you know, she knows I'm not going to watch that stuff without her being around. And then if something comes up, I just shut it off. But anyway, the point is, is that that's what they were doing. And I got a lot of flack from people when I preached that message, the dangers of Duck Dynasty. I mean, I had hate mail like you and believe. How could you say that about Uncle Sid or whatever his name is? Is that his name? I don't know what his name is. <laughs> what is his name? Uncle Cy. How could you say that? Phil's a godly man. Phil's a godly man. I mean, he's got a cool beard. I'll give you that. I'm jealous of the beard. I mean, do you know what the number one comment that was made? I know this is a rabbit trail. I'll try to hurry. You, you know what the number one comment that was made? Well, you only have five people in your church. There's only five people listening. What is that, your family? No, it's Paul's family. He's listening. His family's here. Everybody else ditch me. But Paul's here. Those are the five people you see, okay? And there were actually like 10 people there that day, I think. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how many was here. <laughs> it, it looked bad, though, because all you could see is like two empty chairs in the front. You can see like, you can see like, you can see like two people in the back, and they're like, no wonder why everybody hates him. Look how he preaches. Nobody's even showing up. <laughs> like, that's never stopped me before. It was funny, though. You couldn't imagine the hate mail over, over that. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Still comes in, too. You're just jealous of them. You're just jealous. That's what it is. You're jealous. Yeah, you can tell that's what it is. You got me. I'm jealous. You caught me. That's what it is. I'm jealous. Okay. Oh, anyway. But I brought that up to say this, that if I held salvation by baptism, if I held that in my hands, then I could control whether you could be saved or not. God never gave any man control over your salvation. That is a decision between Christ and you. That is repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a moving and a working of the Holy Ghost of God Amen. under conviction by the Lord. That is not a work of me. I can't baptize you and save you like that. That is absolutely impossible. And God would never leave it under my control to do that for you. He would never leave it up to a man. Otherwise, Rome would be right if it was left. But that's the great sin of baptismal regeneration. The badge of the whore. So where do we see it at? We see it here in Islam. We see work salvation. We see a work salvation here. What do we see here? 
Number one, there are five pillars of Islam. Number one, say the confession of faith. Hey, that sounds like fundamental. Never mind. Um, a, a Muslim must confess God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of God. Number two, they must pray. Muslims are supposed to pray five times a day, shortly before sunrise, mid-morning, noon, mid-afternoon, and after sunset. What happens if you forget once? You're going to hell. Number three, give alms. I like that one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> give alms. Muslims are to give about 2.5% of their wealth. How'd they figure 2.5%? Where'd that figure come from? I'm just curious. They're supposed to give 2.5% of their wealth. Who broke it down like that? I mean, really? Like, it, like when Muhammad was getting... No, it was Joseph Smith that got the golden plates, right? Yeah, when Muhammad was getting his vision, he just said, now I want you to have them give 2.5%. Okay. Number, let's see, number four, fast during Ramadan. For one lunar month, for one loony month, from sunrise to sunset, Muslims are not to allow anything to pass down their throat. What about spit? <laughs> oh, wait, never mind. It's covered. Theoretically, a good Muslim would even spit out his or her saliva. Weird. Then from sunset to sunrise, they are permitted to eat as little or as much as they want. <laughs> That's weird. This is their way of developing discipline and relating to the poor. Travelers, young children, and pregnant or nursing mothers do not need to keep the fast. So it says that somewhere. <laughs> With the exception of this. Number five, they must make a pilgrimage to Mecca. Every Muslim who is financially able is supposed to travel to the birthplace of Islam once in his, in his or her lifetime. That wouldn't be Mecca, that'd be Babylon. But they don't know that. By the way, Muslims have no yeah, Muslims have no guarantee of being saved. They believe that all their works will be accounted for, and that on the judgment day, if your bad works outweigh your good works, you're gonna go to hell. But if your good works outweigh your bad works, you'll probably go to heaven. Probably. Where have we heard that before? How many times do you evangelize Catholics and you're preaching and they say, Well, if my good outweighs my bad? Well, sir, let me assure you, it won't, okay? If you're really evil and rotten, and it won't. Oh, my good... You know, you'll do a lot of good works if you think it's going to get you to heaven. You'll work as hard as you possibly can, and you will do the most wicked, awful things in the name of God to be saved. That's what kings did. That's what many kings did. They did the most awful, wicked, heinous things to Bible believers so the popes would forgive their sins. Muslims have no guarantee of being saved. Since God is all-powerful, they concede that he may do with you as he pleases. Even if you have been very righteous, they hope he won't be having a bad day at judgment. Wow. Wow. Could you think about that for a second? So it's, their God is likened to a man. It's like, well, man, if he's having a bad day, I don't think I want to go that day. I want to stay home that day if I want to go. I mean, God's mad today. I think I'll stay away from there. That's, that's, do you see the mindset of humanism? It's just foolish. Because God's law is God's law in, in the Word of God. It's God's law, and that's just plain as that's what it is. It's not whether he's feeling like it. God doesn't work on emotions like that. That's not how, who God is. Okay, adding to this, uh, he won't be, that is if he doesn't have a bad day. A third possibility is that you could go to hell and burn your sins off for a while and then be allowed into heaven. What's that sound like? Well, where would they have got purgatory from? But they don't call it purgatory. You know what they call it? They call it barzakh. Not temporary, but relief is possible. This is not temporary hell. 
<laughs> they say on their websites, we do not believe in purgatory. But <laughs> it's funny. It's all if you look if you study it. It's in all bold letters. We do not believe in purgatory. It's like they're yelling at you. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, Aaron. If you study, if you read it. Okay, you go down like the website, the website, and they're like screaming at you in all caps. We do not believe in purgatory. We believe in berserk. Or Barzak or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what it's called. I'm not making fun of them. I'm really not. I just don't understand how to pronounce it. So anyway, uh, this is not a temporary hell. Hell is fixed, permanent place. But Allah may allow some Muslims to be released from it because of his mercy. We believe that the prophet will be allowed by Allah to intercede on behalf of some believers. Believers who are in hell. And by Allah's will, they will be taken out of hell. Allah will also take out of hell, out of, out of the hell, some believers, not because someone has interceded on their behalf, but simply because he chooses to. Your simple question, this was a question that a Muslim asked another Muslim priest guy or whatever. Uh, your simple question then required a quite a complicated answer. In summary, as Muslims, we believe some wicked Muslims will be sent to hell for a limited time. For a limited time now, uh, but ultimately will be granted paradise because of the mercy of Allah. Boy, that'd be real comforting to go into the hour of your death with, wouldn't it? Well, number one, I'm hoping he's in a good mood. <laughs> Just hoping he's happy. All right. N number two, he might decide I've done my good might I outweigh my bad, but I don't know what to measure that by. Now, where would they get these ideas from? Roman Catholicism. Come on, folks. This is nothing but Rome. That's all it is. It's Rome repackaged to Arabians. That's what it is. And it's duped them and it's fooled them for years. And I'm going to need a bodyguard by the time I'm finished with this. <laughs> Brother Paul. <laughs> That's right. Works salvation, though, will make a man do anything. If killing will give forgiveness of sins, then Rome had king is killed to receive pardon for sins. Jihad is a ticket to paradise with 72 virgins. First of all, I don't understand why any man would want 72 women around him in the first place like that. I'm not being mean. I'm just saying I don't know how you could handle that. You know what I mean? I don't know if that's paradise. Anyway, they say this. From the most ancient times in the church, good works were also offered. This is Roman Catholicism. Are you listening? From the most ancient times in the church, good works were also offered to God for the salvation of sinners, particularly the works which human weakness finds hard. Because the sufferings of the martyrs for the faith and for, and for God's law were thought to be very valuable, penitence, penitence, used to turn to the martyrs to be helped by their merits to obtain a more speedy reconciliation from the bishops. Indeed, the prayers and good works of holy people were regarded as of such great value that it could be asserted that the penitent was washed, cleansed, and redeemed with the help of the entire Christian people. Yeah. It's not, that's not Bible. That's not salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith. That's what salvation is. Salvation is turning to Jesus Christ and believing the gospel. The finished work of Jesus Christ, what he did on Calvary. It's falling on my face and realizing I'm a wicked sinner before God, and I can't do anything. There is no payment I can give for my sins. I can't wash them away. I can't work them away. I need forgiveness of sins. I need Jesus Christ. I need the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am altogether wicked. He is altogether holy. Next, Rome uses prayer beads and so does Islam. How about that? You, you remember prayer beads, Dad? Did you use those prayer beads? You didn't have a necklace, did you, and hold that thing and rub them beads together, did you? Really? Oh, yeah, the, the, the what do they call them? The, help me out, Brother Andrew, you're Catholic. What is it? Rosary. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he was Luther. Same thing. Same thing. Just you lost the beads. <laughs> That's right. 
All right, these beads that, that Islam uses, the subha beads, are, are most often made of round, glass, wood, plastic, amber, or gemstone. The cord is usually cotton, nylon, or silk. There is a wide variety of colors and styles on the market, ranging from cheap mass-produced prayer beads to those that are made with expensive materials and high-quality workmanship. The subha is used by Muslims to help count recitations and concentrate during personal prayers. The worshiper touches one bead at a time while reciting words, remembrance of Allah. These recitations are often of the 99 names of Allah, or of phrases that glorify and praise Allah. These, pra these phrases are most often repeated as follows. Now I want you to notice this. I want, would you notice these numbers here for a second? Now, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but subhanallah, glory to Allah, they say that 33 times. Isn't that interesting, brother? 33 times. That number 33 is an interesting number. Then they say Alhamadala. Alhamadala? I thought they didn't like ham. It's spelled Alhamadala. It seriously is. I know I'm mutilating it, but that's how it's spelled. Praise be to Allah. That means 33 times. Ahula. Wait. Alu Akbar. Allah is great. 33 times. Now, does anybody remember what the Bible says about vain repetitions? Does anybody remember what the scriptures say? That the, be not as the heathens with their vain repetitions, that they're much speaking, they think that God will hear them. Now why would Islam have the same thing as Rome? Because Rome is the mom of Islam, that's why. That's why. It's patterned after the same thing. The form of the recitation stems from an account in which, in the Hadith, in which the Prophet Muhammad instructed his daughter, Fatima, to remember Allah using these words. He also said that believers who recite these words after every prayer will have all sins pardoned, even if they be as the large as the foam on the surface of the sea. Oh, so you mean it's kind of like rubbing your little beads together and say, Hail Mary? Remember, oh, yeah, I guess... I guess that's kind of the same. And you get sins forgiven when you rub those beads and you say your Hail Marys and your Our Fathers? Oh, okay. I mean, that's kind of, I've never been a Catholic before, but it is kind of weird. They take them into a booth, right, and then they say, we'll say this many Hail Marys and Our Fathers. Is that how that works? Why, how do they pick which number to say? Like how many to say? I see. Maybe they have a chart they go by. Is there a flow chart? <laughs> Sorry. Muslims may also use prayer beads to count multiple recitations of other phrases while in personal prayer. Some Muslims also carry the beads as a source of comfort, fingering them when stressed or anxious. Prayer beads are a common gift item, especially for those returning from haji. That's the pilgrimage? Is that how you say it, Haji? How do you say that, Brother Paul? You were over there. How do you say that? Come on, man. I know we used to throw them our ham slices out of our MRE. You used to throw them ham slices? Yeah. That wasn't very nice of you. You shouldn't have told me that. You weren't saved. Well, at least you're being thoughtful and giving somebody some food. It's kind of nice. All right, number, I don't know next, whatever number it is. Rome has Christ being the final pope, and Islam has their 12th imam. Islam has this final leader that will come, this final world leader that will come. A majority of Shiite Muslims traditionally believe that the 12th imam, Islamic religious leader, born in 868 AD, was placed by God into hiding, known as oculation, O-C-C-U-L-T-A-T-I-O-N. Occultation? That doesn't sound good to put anybody in that. What's that? Yeah. Oh, thank you. All right, great. Until the Day of Judgment, Southern Baptist author and evangelist Shorush, he used to be a Muslim, explained that many Shiites also refer to the 12th Imam as the Mahdi, an Arabic word that generally references a Messiah or a guide. 
This man will come to show them the way because the prayer of every Muslim five times a day ends with, show us the right path. Not the path of those who have incurred your anger or those who are lost, but those upon whom grace has come, Shoro said. Though most strains of Islam have a belief in the Mahdi, Shiites traditionally believe he is Muhammad ibn Hazan, the twelfth in the line of Imams, who were descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. Though they do not know when the Mahdi will return, they believe he will come to the end of the misery of his people. Come to the end of the misery of his people. Some strains of Islam even hold a belief that Jesus will be the Mahdi who will return and proclaim Islam as the true religion. Well, now, if the Jesus that they have. What did Jesus say? He said, one will come in his own name, and him you will receive. I'm telling you that I believe that 12th imam will be the man, the Antichrist, the one that the world is looking for. Each culture is looking for, an, for a man to come. Each one of them. Talk about a man to come. Each one of them. That a man will come and he will fulfill that role. The belief, that the belief in a savior is universal, BBC News quoted Ahmadinejad as saying in January. It is the pivot of our beliefs as Muslims and Iranians. We believe that an offspring of the Prophet may, uh, uh, offspring of the Prophet may peace be upon him, will be the ultimate savior. His name and attributes are clear. He will come and will administer ultimate justice. The belief that the Mahdi's return is near is not a new claim among Shiites, Wagner said, but one that has been held almost since the 12th imam was historically placed into hiding. He went into hiding somewhere. Almost every generation has some figures in Islam that either claim to be the 12th imam or claim that the 12th imam will come to himself. By the way, when you look at the attributes, I was reading some of the things that talked about the attributes of this 12th imam and who he will be and what he will do. They say that he will be a master of numerology. They see he will be able to read minds. He will be able to predict future events. Everything that they start to describe about him is the same power that the Antichrist will have and, the, and a lot of the controls that he'll be able to have. And uh, anyway, so that 12th Imam and, and then the Pope, um, you know, I'll, I'll read you something here from Malachi. Anybody ever heard of Malachi Martin? Anybody ever heard of him? Some of you might have heard of him. Let me see here if I can find his quote. Oh, let me read you this, though. The Bible is the indispensable part of the furniture of the Christian Lodge, only because it is a sacred book of the Christian religion, the Hebrew Pentateuch in the Hebrew Lodge, and the Koran in the Muhammadan one, belong on the altar. And one of these, and the square and the compass, properly understood are the great lights by which a mason must walk and work. How is the Koran by that light? <clears throat> which they must walk and work by. That's kind of scary, isn't it? But anyway, that's what they believe. I'm looking for one other one. Let me see if I can find it here. I want to read it to you if I can find it. Uh, let's see. I'll check my email. I want to read this by Malachi Martin and what he said because I found it kind of fascinating in what he said about it. Let's see. Let's see if I can find it. No. Let's see. Yeah, Vatican insider Dr. Malachi Martin has said that based on the message of Mary and a personal visitation, John Paul believes there will come a day when the heart of Islam, already attuned to the figures of Christ and of Christ's mother Mary, will receive the illumination it needs. Now, when you hear that word illumination like that, that's a code word for the occult. Okay, understand that. The way it's used there, that's always a code word for the most part. Illumination it needs. A second Fatima in which they will recognize him as God's vicar on earth. Then will fellow travelers... Now that right there is interesting language too because that fellow travelers... Who knows where that, that saying comes from? Freemasonry. Fellow traveler. Fellow traveler. Right? Freemasonry. Then will fellow travelers like the Church of England, the Episcopal Church, and others of like mind, the Pope could be worshipped as the infallible Holy Father by over one half of the world's population. 
See, all he's waiting for is that worldwide worship. That's what he wants. And you know, one of the last identifying factors that we see between Rome and Islam is the murder of Christians. The murder of true Bible-believing Christians will happen all over the world and has happened all over the world by both Muslims and by Rome. Why? Well, first of all, they made a deal to do that. The Pope made a deal a long, long time ago. They made a deal that they would kill and eradicate Christians, but, but most Roman Catholics will not be eradicated. Now, there's some that are being killed because the Pope will sacrifice his own people. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about that. He would kill anybody. He'd kill his mother if he had to. He didn't care. But um, Islam was the weapon of the Pope that he used to kill Jews and Christians down through the centuries. True Christians were murdered by Rome. And one of the identifying factors that you see a hate for Jesus Christ and a hate for the Bible, Christianity, a hate for this book, you find that in Revelation chapter 17, verse number 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. They have a hate for, for Christians. They have a hate for Bible-believing Christians. They just do. Your upper-level ones do. They, they, they have an absolute hate for it, and they want to destroy it. Why? Because you don't worship Allah. You will not serve their God. You will not fall by the sword. And they believe in conquering by the sword. That's what they believe. They don't believe that salvation is between you and, you and God. They believe that they can force it through the sword. That's what they believe. And that's what they want to do. But that's not what the scriptures tell us to do. The scriptures tell us to plead with men, to go out and preach the gospel. You know, we get it's funny, we've seen people compare us. Oh, that's just like I had one guy stop by and he was in the military and I was preaching. Where were Paul? We were up north. We we're up in the city somewhere. And I was preaching and this this soldier came. I just got back from where was it? Afghanistan. I just got back from Afghanistan and and you remind me of the people that I was shooting and, uh, shooting and fighting over there because of religion. I said, really? Because I don't have a gun in my hand and I'm not trying to kill anybody. I've got a Bible in my hand, if you want to call this. This is that spiritual 66 caliber right here. This will do some damage. Yeah, it sure will. And that man was looking at me with hate and disgust and I just took my Bible out and I said, you know, I pointed it and I preached to him. And I told him, you know, you might have done some things in the name of your country over there, but that doesn't mean God approved of it. And you're just, yeah. No, no, of course not. Yeah. When you see a soldier like that and you see some of the men that are out there today and the way they look at you in their eyes and the way they talk to, to American citizens and the way they feel about them, they'd, they'd stick a knife in your back in a second, a lot of them would. Because they've been trained to do it. They've been conditioned to do it. Not all of them but a great number of them. And they would obey their government before their God. And they would slaughter Bible-believing Christians in a heartbeat. Do you realize that we in this country, by the grace of God, we are the only people that stand between judgment? And if you and I don't stand in the gap and tell the truth, and I'm going to use this thing of free speech and use this thing of, of the First Amendment for as long as I can and get out as much truth over that Internet and get out as much truth about that and try to warn the billions of Muslims that are stuck in a false, pagan, occult, occultic religion that is a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. It is the mother of all secrets. It is the trick. They've been bamboozled. They've been fooled by the devil. It is the same thing as Babylon repackaged to the Arabian people. And then you have the nation of Islam of black Muslims in America. And they're lost and dying in their sins. They've been fooled. They've been duped. They've been tricked. You have the Hebrew Israelism. You have all these different groups out there that they've been fooled. They don't know what the Bible says. They don't have any authority with the scriptures. And the Bible is plainly plainly speaks against them. So why do we why do we show these distinctions and why do we show these things? Because maybe it'll give you just a little bit more to help somebody with. Maybe it'll educate you a little bit on how you could help somebody. But if your Christianity is just all about you then you don't care. I've had some people say, oh, you don't preach Jesus enough. I preach Jesus every week. I don't know what you're talking about. 
It's just I'm not going to preach the, a gospel message and give an invitation for people that are already born again. And, they, and, they, and you know what? If you're not saved and you're here, you'll, you'll definitely get enough Holy Spirit Scripture thrown at you and enough of the, of the, of the, the, the Spirit bearing witness. As in, look at, look at um, uh, Louise in the back there. See, we're, we're so shallow. We actually believe that, that it's us doing it. She listened. She came every week, and she listened to a sermon that was preached three years ago. A bunch of them. Why do we think that we can limit God so much that you can't teach about other things or you can't educate people into the into things so they so they grow so they know a little bit more than singing Jesus loves me to somebody? Because you know what, I see those people every week out on the street, and they don't know anything about the Bible. They're lost and dying in their sins, and they can't explain anything to you. All they walk around and do is sing that same Sunday school song that your little kid got taught when he was five years old. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus loves everybody. That's all they repeat. God loves everybody. Don't judge. God loves everybody. Judge not. <laughs> judge not. God loves everybody. God loves everybody. Judge not. God loves everybody. They sound like a vain repetition. That's all they do, and they sip the little cute signs. They should oh, see, judge not. Oh, well, then now I'm done. I'm not going to say anything now because you, you see those two words. I'm done now. I, can't, I don't even know what to say to you because you said judge not. I mean, but that's what you run into. Why? Because pastors don't teach anything. So now maybe if you run across a Muslim, you can give them some information. Maybe you could have some things on CD. Maybe you could give it to them and you could say, hey, why don't you take this home and listen to it? It might, some things might make you mad, but listen to it all the way through and think about it. After all, it's only their soul. But you know what? More people in America would rather see those Muslims go to hell than go to heaven. They would rather see them blown up or shot up because they think every single Muslim is trying to kill them in, in the world. And it's not true. They're just not. Some people like living here. Some people like to, they, they like nice things. Some, some of them are just like you. All this hate for either Jews or Muslims or black people or white people or, or, or Indians or, or, or whoever. All this hate. It's nothing to do with the scriptures. It's not biblical. The Bible says that you love one another. You ought to love a man enough. If you really believe he's wrong, then preach the Bible to him and tell him the truth that he can be saved. Preach the truth to them. That's what they need. They need that Muslim. That one day, there's a video of me dealing with a Muslim up in Minneapolis, and he was telling us that we were doing it wrong. And I always love it when a, you know, everybody tells you you're doing it wrong, but when a Muslim man comes up to Christians and tells them that you're preaching Jesus wrong, I mean, that's just pretty amazing. <laughs> that's just pretty amazing. <laughs> but he come, so I straightened him out and I told him the truth. But watch the video. Can you give an answer to them? That's why we're commanded to give an answer. So study, learn. That's what we're doing this for. I want to help some people that are stuck in these mystery religions, these cults and everywhere. I've got, I've got a burden for those people that are stuck in these places. They need. If it's not for men that talk about things like this, there's a lot of guys out there that wouldn't even be saved because some people had the thought enough to tell them and to warn them. The things on witchcraft and the druids and all those things. It's because, that's why we do it. Because there's people out there that everybody thinks they're done. Oh, they served idols. They, they serve a false god. They can't be saved. Or they're in witchcraft. Well, remember I preached that message on Hezekiah or uh, Manasseh? How deep Manasseh was? He did everything against God. And he fell on his knees and he repented after God chastened him. And he was forgiven. And your son can be, your daughter can be, your friends can be, family members can be. No, it's not too late. As long as there's breath. And these people need to be reached that are stuck in cults. But you know what? They end up going to some spooky charismatic churches because Baptists don't want them there. Because Baptists think something's wrong with them when they come in because they, they get saved and they're, they're, it's awkward for them to be there because they didn't grow up wearing a suit and a tie and, and doing everything perfect. They didn't grow up that way. Not that there's anything against a suit and a tie. I'm just saying. But Paul always looks better than me. He's, he's always dressed up. 
Lee's not, and he's a banker. He's supposed to be. I don't know what's wrong with him. What are we doing with this? Listen, we got we got, we got Brother Paul's electrician, and you're a banker, and he's got it right here. That's why he's that's why he's running the street preaching right there. No, I appreciate Brother Paul. He's got a burden. But you know what? Brother Paul has the same burden for people. He'll go out and talk to those people. He's talked to plenty of Muslims. He talked to a Muslim man in front of a, a, a liquor store. Man, I wish you would have had that on tape, brother. I'd love to see that. But he talked to that man, tried to reach that man. He's a Somali, wasn't he? Yeah, tried to reach him. Why? Because he doesn't hate him. You know how many Christians? You know why they think that Christians hate them? That's what they think in their mind. Most of them think that. And Christians, these, these people are nuts. They want to kill everybody. What would you feel if you've seen on the news where people are doing that? What, yeah, because the Catholics, right? And then, and then the war machine. No, they they just hate us. No, I don't hate you, man. I've told them that. I've told Muslims, I don't hate you, man. I don't hate you. You need to be saved. All right, let's go. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Lord, I pray for these billions of Muslims that are out there, Lord, that need to be saved. Lord, they need to be delivered from darkness, translated in the kingdom of light. Lord, help us to be able to reach them. Help us to be able to reach others for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to be able to reach these Roman Catholics, Lord. We don't hate Roman Catholics either, Lord. We're not mad at Roman Catholic people. Lord, we're like Charles Chiniqui. He dedicated his book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, to the Roman Catholic people because he wanted them to be saved. But Lord, we hate the damnable, wicked papacy and the wickedness that it's wrought and the and the wickedness of the black pope and the pope over there and all the Jesuit order and all that they've done, Lord. And we just pray. We know someday, Lord, you're going to break that. But Lord, we pray that we would be able to chip away at the devil's kingdom and that you would use us to bring some sons to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's it.